Hi, everybody. This is Daryl. We're back for week three. Uh, looks like we have a good crowd today. I uh, want everybody to know, those of you that have turned in your, uh, your plan for your presentation, I got through them today. I got everybody feedback to every, back to everybody so we can get started. And uh, that's what we want to do out this entire week to is just giving you the opportunity to work on nothing but your presentation. Uh, we've kind of cleared the decks. There still is a little bit of reading to do, but uh, and uh, um, we, we, we've um, made the um, discussion board into something that's not a, uh, a, a due assignment. Uh, and I'll explain all that today. But uh, basically, I just want to get everybody set up and you, you, allow you to concentrate, spend the entire week creating your presentation. Now, I did say that there was some reading uh, to do, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, it's in Slideology. And I want to acknowledge that we have been having some issues with uh, people getting into or getting their credentials uh, read in uh, the O'Reilly Books thing. Uh, I've heard about that, and I've heard that they're working on it. So. Hopefully that's not an issue anymore. It was affecting people earlier last week. If anybody is still having trouble getting access to the books or having trouble reading the books in the form they're in, get a hold of me. I, I want to make sure you have uh, access to them and I have access to some books that I can, I can lend you and, and stuff. So you should not really um, look at that O'Reilly site as a hindrance. If you're having trouble with it, we will route around it. Uh, you know, the important thing is for us to get our work done. So, um, among the reading that uh, we're assigning this week, uh, is a couple more chapters from slide, uh, Slideology. One of them is called the, uh, uh, the Five Theses of the Art of a Presentation. And this is where Nancy first, uh, Nancy Duarte first, you know, put out her notion of what good presentations should be doing. And the first one we've already heard about, we, we hear it a couple of times in every chapter, focus on the audience. And that's what a lot of you heard from me today, you know, that, uh, if you weren't really sure who you were talking to, I want you to have a clear notion in mind. And, you know, um, remember, this is an assignment. This is something to help me make you better. This is not a contract that you're, you're, you're locked into for life. So I don't want you to agonize over this decision of who you're presenting to. If it's somebody that you admire and you think you can learn from, then choose them for this exercise. It doesn't mean that 30 months from now, you will be forced to seek your employment from them. Uh, this is just, I want you to have a particular company in mind. You know, I don't want you to say, I want to, I want to join an art, uh, a graphic design company. I want you to find a graphic design company and have a notion of who they are and a notion of who that person you're talking to is, because that's what presentations are all about is delivering to specific people. The vaguer your notion of who you're talking to is, the more general your language is going to be and everything gets mushier. But the more specific your target is, the more specific your language is. And that's what we want to work on. We want to work on telling our stories in a very specific way to very specific people. And it all begins with focusing in on the audience, knowing who you're talking to, knowing how to tailor what you have to say to their ears so that you are telling the story to them in a way that makes the most sense. And we don't want to generalize to include everybody. We want to very much tell our story to our target audience and make that bullseye. So focus on the audience. You've heard that. Tell stories. All right. Um, we all are going to have to, to struggle with what it means to talk about ourselves and, 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 and our skills and essentially take our resumes and turn them into a presentation. And there are different strategies for that. I have some movies that I want to talk to you about that uh, I want you to watch and, and different things to think about. But um, in your notes last week, you're basically going through items in your life that you might want to talk about. And now as you're just constructing the narrative, a three to four minute narrative that will form the basis of your presentation, you want to turn that into a story. You want to connect all that together. And that means sometimes that uh, there are things that you did that, that don't fit the narrative, that don't fit the target audience, that don't fit what you have to say in this three to four minute version of yourself. 
and it might have to go. And uh, what a lot of you are going to find, and, and this happens a lot, is that sometimes when you sit down to tell your story and I say, I want you to make it three to four minutes, it becomes seven to eight minutes. And, and as you look at your life, somehow you had to make that seven to eight minute version. Well, you make that in the first draft and then I will look at it and I will give you feedback and then we will try to make that closer to the three to four minute version. Because these are different versions. There's the 30 second elevator pitch in which you have to throw away a lot of information. And there's the longer pitch. And for some people, they have to make the longer version for themselves before they can ever start to make the shorter version for other people. And these are all strategies for how do we tell stories? How do we become the storyteller that helps our audience get to where they need to be? And there's no one way to do this. It's learning a lot of different techniques. It's looking at a lot of other people's solutions and, and, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And it's a lifetime of thinking about what makes a good story, what makes a good connection to your audience. So I want you to tell stories. And after you put that story together, then we're gonna make it a presentation. Then we're gonna put it into presentation software and add images and video, multimedia, and we wanna show, don't tell. Well, we're still telling, we want that voiceover. That is your connection to the audience. But in addition, to the words from your mouth, we want you to come up with images that really resonate with the audience, that help them understand what you're saying. And that's what this is all about. And to that end, I actually have an exercise that I want to work on uh, today. Uh, it's called Visualize Ideas. And I realize that a lot of you, as you're, as you're looking at your resume and trying to turn that into a story somehow, there's an awful lot of stuff that's on your resume that is sort of cliche rote language. You know, we all say this about ourselves. We're a go-getter. We think outside the box. We're, we're a team player, um, you know, and we use these same words so often and they're important to put it in your resume because everybody else has put it in your resume, but they don't mean anything because everybody else has used those same words. But now when we go to multimedia, when we go to presentation, we have the opportunity to really make it into something else. So how do you take an idea? How do you take a term, a, 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 a literary term that people you know, hear all the time and make it new and fresh? Well, you find just the right image to combine it with. So uh, I want to uh, go into uh, the browser a minute here and um, I have created in the discussion board. Now you'll notice, as I said earlier uh, this week, the discussion board this week is not a graded activity. It's, it's a feedback loop. It's a way for you to put up stuff for you to ask people to give you opinions on and for you to give other people advice and, and so on and so forth. So to that end, I put a couple of movies in here and I put some links in here. I put a couple of things I want to, uh, and I will go through them. I'll go through these movies in a minute. But I've also put in here a link to a, uh, a common page that I have. It's, uh, it's a Google Doc that I created called Visualizing Ideas. And the exercise is this. Uh, I come up with a couple of terms that are the kind of things that uh, everybody always puts on their resume. And so the idea is, okay, the language might be well-trodden, but now how can you visualize that language in a way that makes it fresh and new and exciting? So this is, a, this is an exercise in finding just the right image to tell a story your way to your audience. Remember, it, it, it's, it has to express who you are and it has to be effective to your audience. So you have to know who you're talking to. You know, if you were talking to third graders, then I'm sure little cartoon pictures would work really well. But if you're talking to CEOs of companies that you admire, then you're going to have to kind of aim up. You're going to have to up your game in being visually sophisticated. And you want to impress them with the way that you can uh, visualize and, and uh, create stories out of images. So what I've done here is I've created um, a page. This is called a, a Google document 
means that everyone who goes to this link, I want you to, I put the link in the chat box and I want everybody to click on that link and you're gonna to go to it in your browser. And when you're on this page, you are on this page and everyone who is here has full editing permissions. Now this is a slightly dangerous thing. Any one of you could select all and delete and wipe out this page. So we wanna work collaboratively and there's some little rules here. So what I've done is I've created a number of boxes here and I have five terms here that I want you to try to come up with an image to visualize that is specific to your taste and to the audience that you're trying to project to. And so rather than all of us work at the same place, uh, if you'll notice when you come in, you each have a different color and your cursor is that color. So you can see where your cursor is and wherever your cursor is, you can make changes, you can type, you can, uh, you can add or wipe things out. So we wanna control that. And what I've done here is created a number of boxes underneath each one of these words. And before you actually start creating your image, I want you to claim a box. So I did the first one here. I did the adventurous and I, 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 I picked your picture of a guy standing on a mountain looking over, you know, to me that says adventurous. That's my interpretation of that term. So I'm gonna do another one here and I've claimed it. I've written my name, Daryl. So I want you guys, uh, there are plenty of boxes under here. Nobody has to be, not everybody has to be at the top, but I want you to be in the row of the word that you're picking. So if you pick problem solver, you can be in this last column uh, in, as far down as you want. It doesn't really matter, but uh, the, these are all, this column is all uh, images of problem solver. So, if you're not at the top, you can just be anywhere down here. But before you actually create your image, claim it off so nobody else will take your spot. Now, once you've claimed a, a square, then you wanna move your cursor from the square where you wrote your name up into the larger box. You just wanna put your cursor in there. And that means that uh, when the image drops in, it'll drop into that box. So we're all controlling how we're using the space and we're all putting our cursor in different spots. So once you've got your cursor in the spot you want, if we come up to insert image, there's a, a function in the toolbar called insert image search the web. This is a Google doc, remember. So Google has a built search into this page. So Google search is right here. So the first thing you might tend to wanna do is just type the term I put in here, team player. And of course, you're searching Google web. We've got all of these images of soccer guys, you know, uh, and as with Google, you, you put a search in and there's 300,000, 4 million hits. Don't be the guy who always picks the first thing. You know, that's the first thing Google wants. It's not saying who you are yet. Google doesn't read your mind. They just read the term. And it might not also be the best idea to put the term in here. I put team player in and it's pretty much going to soccer, which speaks to some people, but it doesn't really have what I want in mind. And I actually have a fairly focused image that I want in my head. So I don't have to search for the term team player. I know what kind of image I want. So I'm gonna put skydiving team in here because I have this notion of people falling through space and creating formations and that being a kind of dynamic picture. And I'm looking, and here I find exactly the picture I want. To me, this says team player. And so it's a, a dynamic picture, it expresses who I want. I've selected, it. it's got a blue check mark on it, and down at the bottom, you can see that there's an insert button. So when I hit insert, it will then take that picture and put it in my box for me. So that's what I'm asking all of you guys to do. Pick your word, open up the search engine. You can do that by insert image, search the web, and search on the term, search on other things. Think about who you want. Think about what kind of imagery you want. If you're a video game player and you're gonna be presenting to the boss of a video game company, maybe you want video game footage that says something or other. So you all want to choose different imagery based on who you're talking to, how you're gonna reach them or impress them, uh, and, and what it says about you. Um, okay, 
So uh, each one of you are going to be different. Each one of you are going to be expressing your style by showing what you do have here. So Jalen already has a really cool anime image. Uh, and I can tell a lot about Jalen from the choice he makes. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to let you guys work on that while I continue talking. I'm going to come back here. But that's going to be there. And for those of you who are watching on video, know that uh, I have linked that in the discussion board. If, if you'll note, I already uh, showed you that it's in this list here. So you can click on it in the discussion board and you're going to be linked exactly to the same page and you can participate all week. So uh, that activity is available to you. So um, you guys work on that. We'll come back and take a look and see how you did later on. But it's not a, this is just an activity. This is not an assignment or anything. This is just to help hone and sharpen your skills. Because you're, what you're going to try to do is take language that maybe you use all the time and turn it into something that, um, you know, uh, captures people's imagination. So uh, that takes some skill. That's a creative act. And that's really the fun part of being a creative artist is figuring out what visuals tell your story. And all this goes towards figuring out what the hell are we going to do to talk about ourselves? What is the story we want to put together? It's all fine and good for me to say, tell a story. But you look at the facts of your life and you wonder, well, how do I do that? Well, there are a number of ways and strategies for telling a story. Uh, last week, you guys all did an excellent job with your emotional storytelling. And you all told stories your own way. You all didn't do it the same way because there are so many different and uh, viable ways to tell a story. And the important part that you want to accomplish in this presentation is to talk confidently about yourself and express the skills that you have. Now, for a lot of you, it's going to be chronological order. You know, I, I began at five, I was playing the piano, and then I started being in the church choir, and then I wrote original music, and then I went on the road, and, and uh, so on and so forth. You turn it into um, a chronological narrative. But for a lot of you, there are different ways to go. Uh, maybe you've had several careers. Maybe, uh, you know, you learn multiple things. And so uh, it isn't the same for everybody to tell the same story. But we do know that I want you to have a section in the middle where you talk about your skills. Now, this is not synonymous with full sale. For the most part, you're going to gain your heavy duty skills at full sale. So that's what you'll talk about. But if you are a musician and, and you, you went on the road or you played in a band, that's in a significant part of how you gain your skills. That's what you're going to want to talk about. Um, if you were in the army and that turned you into a, an organized person, uh, then that's, uh, that's going to be part of the story that you have to tell. So for each of you, it's a different notion of what makes you who you are. And you're going to have to figure that out. Now, some of the videos that I posted in the discussion that I want you to watch, they're voluntary. You don't have to watch them, but I just think they'll be helpful. Um, I think will be useful to some of you in, in terms of putting together that narrative structure. And the first one that's in there is an actual TED Talk. It's by a fellow named Simon Sinek. And he's very, very smart. And I think that a lot of you are gonna find this useful. It's called Start With Why. And the notion here is that what we're essentially doing is we're taking our resume and we're turning that into a presentation. Now, we said in week one that the way to do a boring PowerPoint is just to take a list of facts and recite them. And so if all you did was to take your resume and recite it in a PowerPoint, that would be that boring presentation. Then I worked at Starbucks. And after I worked at Starbucks, I worked at McDonald's, blah, 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 blah. You're, you just list your resume. Um, but the items in your resume represent who you are. They represent what you've done in your life. They are those milestones. So just listing them off might not be all that interesting. But the trick that Simon Sinek tells us in his video is if you take that very same resume with that list of all the things that you have done in your life, what you have done in your life, 
and flip it over. And instead of saying what you did, tell us why you did each one of those things, then that's the story. That's what Simon Sinek means with start with why. Look at all the events in your life and tell us what was the intrinsic motivation that drove you to do this? Why did you start learning the piano? Why did you play video games and pick them apart? That begins to tell us who you are and it becomes much more exciting. So you're doing a little bit of self-analysis here, but if you're wanting to tell us why, then you're giving us much more information and it's much more interesting and exciting. It's not a listing of things you've done, but it is a look into your heart and soul and why you want to create and be the person that you are. And that will become a much more interesting story. So those of you that are looking at, you know, your life and your resume and you're wondering, how do I tell the story? If you think, if, if you watch Simon Sinek's video and start with why, I think that's going to help an awful lot of you out. Now, the second video is a little uh, uh, less common for everybody. It's a, it's a little uh, wacky, but uh, it's, it's uh, very useful. It's called How to Structure a, Vi a Visual uh, a Video Essay by Tony Zhou. And what he does is he looks at a documentary by Orson Welles in which there wasn't one subject or two subjects or even three subjects, but there were six different subjects. Orson Welles documentary F for Fake has six different subjects that it looks at. And it's not uh, a 60 minutes type anthology in which there are six separate stories, one finishes and then the other begins. He tells all six stories at once, tells a little bit of one and then moves on and talk, starts to talk about another. And then he moves, jumps back, jumps back. And that excitement of moving from vantage point to vantage point creates a narrative creates a story structure that makes us excited and want to know more about each one. Now, how can that help you? Well, if you have um, a long and, and varied life and you did lots of things, you've worked lots of jobs, and you're not quite sure that it all fit together, but you know that all of it is equals to who you are, then maybe you don't want to tell your story in chronological order, but you want to tell it at, uh, as a, a series of parallel stories. You know, that you're interested in cars and you're interested in audio and you're interested in art. And, you know, that's how you got into designing cars or creating graphics for audio, uh, for, for cars. You know, that you never really know how life turns out. And so you may want to tell the multiple parts of your story in that fashion. And the interesting way that he makes us understand what he's talking about is he relates it to something that we've all seen and really haven't paid that much attention to, which is the uh, TV show South Park, the little animated uh, story of a bunch of snotty kids in, in Colorado. And every episode of South Park that exists is 22 minutes long. It has three different stories that happen in parallel, bouncing back and forth, and then they resolve at the end and become the same story. If you, if you watch South Park, you will understand that that structure is there and that's exactly how they create every single episode. And, uh, you know, it's a story structure strategy. And it may not work for you this time, but it, it may be just the thing. And uh, if it doesn't work for you now, maybe next time down the road, you, when you have a, a presentation that you need to do, uh, that will work. Um, is everybody still hearing the audio? I heard that there was a complaint uh so the audio is working all right i'm gonna keep going then uh i never can tell uh all right um the other another section of the reading the last one i'm going to mention is uh, uh about ways to appeal to the audience people have been standing up and talking to audiences for thousands of years in fact it was a very popular pastime in ancient greece uh where public speaking was a, a big thing and uh, a famous writer, philosopher, Aristotle, looked at all of these public speakers and he wrote something called The Three Pillars of Public Speaking about ways to appeal to an audience in terms of your relationship to the audience. And it's relevant today. So as you think about who you are and what kind of story you have to tell, you're going to fall into one of three categories. First category is ethos the appeal to trust. The audience is going to listen to you 
because you're somebody that they can trust. You sound sincere, you have hail in your voice, you maybe have some uh, history on the subject, so you, you've got some gravitas. There are any number of reasons why someone will listen to you, but essentially, if you're trustworthy, they'll, they'll believe what you have to say. But maybe you're kind of young and you don't have a lot of history on the subject. Uh, how can you still get them to appeal to you? Well, the appeal to pathos is the appeal to emotion. So if you're a young student and you've got lots of enthusiasm for the subject, but maybe your resume isn't really long, you might want to appeal to your audience to say, I have so much passion for this. Remember when you were young and you were inexperienced but had this much passion and, and you can bond with your audience that way. So it's an emotional appeal rather than um, um, an, a, a sincerity appeal. And the third way to go is by logic. Logos is the appeal to logic. You're gonna to put together an argument and you're gonna back it up. So if the audience is looking to blow holes in your argument, you're always there to make sure that you're backing up everything you said. If you state a fact, you say where it came from. You might have footnotes, you might have uh, references, charts and graphs. You're gonna use lots of uh, factual material to back up what you're saying because you're, you're expecting the audience to be skeptical but you're always expecting them to not find any fault with what you have to say. If your argument is completely um, uh, backed up by, by facts and truth, then the appeal to logic is a way to win your audience over. And again, this, this has appeal for different kinds of material. Some material is naturally emotional and, and pathos works for it. Some material is basically um, based steeped in logic. If you're trying to sell yourself as a web programmer or uh, um, um, someone who can be a, 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 um, a data security in tech, tech, then the appeal to logic is probably going to be more important than the appeal to, to uh, emotion. So each one of these has a couple of different factors. In the appeal to ethos, uh, the audience uh, asked, or do they respect you? You know, does the audience believe you're a good character? Does the audience believe that you're generally trustworthy? You know, they're looking to find someone that they can believe in as, as, as a, a talker. Does the audience believe you're an authority on the subject? And there are different ways to become an authority. You know, you can have a bunch of titles after your name. You can be a doctor and you studied here, and you wrote this book, etc. And that becomes the, the basis of their respect. You can also be somebody who's um, just have lived experience. You know, maybe you're only 15 years old and you're going to stand in front of the audience and talk about cancer. Well, you aren't a doctor, you haven't studied at a university or anything, but you, you know, right off you're going to say, well, my mother just died of cancer and I lived with her for the last three years and that lived experience is what I have to tell you about. So uh, the audience is going to believe you because you state what your basis for authenticity is all about. In pathos, does your words evoke feelings of love, sympathy, fear? Now, if you're, if you're uh, a neophyte and you want to get people to like you, you're going to look for happy emotions. You're going to look for images of, of puppies or, or things that make people smile or make people happy. But the appeal to pathos cuts both ways. You have good emotions and negative emotions. And in terms of presentation, uh, you know, your, your, your visuals can evoke feelings of of compassion or envy. You know, you can, you can go to negative emotions. Do your characterization of the competition evoke feelings of contempt? Now, this isn't something you're gonna deal with in your presentation because I don't want you to even talk about the other people going for the job. When you have your three or four minutes in front of your dream employer, I don't want you to say things like, I know there are thousands of other people you can pick. That's a true statement, but there's no reason for you to say it. When you have your three or four minutes, I want you to only focus on yourself. I want you to ignore the fact that there's anybody else that even possibly could want this job because it's not your job in your presentation to invoke doubt. Your presentation should be only about yourself. Now, given that, in general presentations, as we're learning to make these things, you're gonna know that a lot of times, people don't feel good about themselves enough that they're gonna spend most of their um, ammunition beating up on the other guy. 
Now this, we're, we're about to enter the political season and this is 100% the way political advertising works. Political ad, uh, politicians never stand up and say, I'm a good guy, vote for me. They always stand up and say, the other guy is awful. You should never vote for him. Negative advertising in politics seems to work and it seems to be everywhere. Uh, and it, you know, it, it carries with it this kind of uh, underlying dread. So the appeal to pathos is a very powerful and thing and can swing both ways. You have to be careful about it because once you introduce negative emotions, they can swing back on you. In your case, I want you to only focus on good, happy emotions. That's the way you're going to appeal to the audience that you want in this case. With Logos, uh, does your message make sense? Is your message based on facts, statistics, and evidence? Uh, will your call to action lead to the desired outcome that you promised? You know, you might think of this almost like the summation of a legal case. You know, at the end of uh, a law uh, or uh, end of a trial, the, uh, the lawyer stands up and he summarizes everything that he said before. And everything he said, he's already introduced evidence. He's already had witnesses testify to. So everything that he says is backed up by, you know, the, this, um, uh, this person said this, and this document showed this, etc. And in the end, he leads to an inevitable conclusion. And that's the takeaway of a presentation. If you have a logos based presentation, then the very takeaway is the thing you've been leading up all to now. Therefore, you should hire me. Therefore, you should buy this product. Therefore, you should join this cause. A logos-based argument leads inevitably to the final call to action, which you're asking the audience to do. So these sometimes overlap. Usually, you're going to focus on one or the other. Sometimes, if you have ethos, uh, you have a little bit of pathos, or they overlay, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, it's rare that you get all three in the same presentation. If you do, then you're absolutely one. But you, you basically aim for one particular um, shot. It can be uh, overlaps of one of, the, of, of one or two. Um, that's pretty common. It's very rare that they all occur in the same presentation because uh, they are different kinds of appeals to different audiences. So uh, that's in the reading. It's, it's there. It's useful information. And we'll talk about it a little bit more next week. So uh, that's all the reading I want to do. I want to spend the rest of the day just talking about uh, software, talking about um, um, things you guys can do to be helpful here. So in that regard, I want to talk about what, what are some of the productions, what are some of the presentation software you can use. We've given you PowerPoint and uh, you know, you've got it installed on your machine. We've talked about PowerPoint before. So you're all certainly free to use PowerPoint, but you don't have to use PowerPoint. Uh, PowerPoint is very fine software. It's also uh, uh, very rich, meaning that there's a lot of stuff to it. And sometimes it's a little intimidating because there's just so many items. You know, Microsoft has been putting it out for 20 years and every year they, they put a new version out, they have to add a little bit to it. So it's now become so feature rich that one of the problems with PowerPoint is that it has so many things in it that some stuff is hidden. And, um, you know, without being an expert in PowerPoint or having someone around to show you where the hidden stuff is, it's hard to work with on your own. So if you don't feel real uh, well steeped in PowerPoint, that's not a great pro product to use straight out of the bat without any help. So what is a good, uh, um, thing to begin with. Well, last week we recommended Adobe Spark. I think a lot of you had a good experience with it. If you want to continue, Adobe Spark is something that's very easy to pick up right from the beginning and learn how to use it. It doesn't have so many options in it that it becomes difficult to use. Uh, Google, the Google Doc, uh, I'm going to get back to visualizing ideas in a minute, but the uh, in Google Tools, they have a presentation tool, just like they have a uh, document tool. And Google Slides is very much like PowerPoint with a lot of the options stripped out. So one of the things that's nice about using Google Slides is that um, it's 
fewer choices. And therefore, if you're using it for the very first time, there's less that you have to deal with. Now, there's a problem with Google Slides and there's a problem with a lot of these online tools. And that is that they do not include audio functions. Now, as we look at the presentation that's due, um, and actually, uh, it would be a good idea to do that before I get back to talking about different softwares. So if we look at the assignment this week, uh, this assignment page, you want you to all to come here. I want you to watch this video. It kind of reemphasizes some things that we heard before uh, and frames it for us. If you look at the instructions, the instructions are not anything new. We told you what this assignment was last week. But what is helpful about the, this week is that it restates the parameters. So uh, it mentions that we want you to make uh, um, a program that's three to four minutes long, that it has to contain a voiceover, that you can use the production tool of your choice. And we mentioned some helpful ones here, Keynote, PowerPoint, Prezi, Adobe Spark, Google Slides. I'm gonna mention some more, but uh, the, the instruction sheet for this week is very short because you all were given the instructions last week. So nothing has changed. This first draft, I want a complete presentation. Remember, this is a first draft, this isn't a rough draft. Doesn't mean you get to leave stuff out. I want a complete presentation. I want three to four minutes of audio by you that's accompanied by slides. And that can be done on any program you choose. I'm recommending Adobe Spark. Uh, but in addition to Adobe Spark, some great choices are um, uh, things that I mentioned in here. And if we come back to the discussion board. And uh, here's the Simon Sinek video that we mentioned. Here's the uh, Tony Zhou video. So you can watch those whenever you have a chance. So I listened a bunch of, of uh, uh, tools, Adobe Spark. Uh, now with Adobe Spark, there are three types of, of files that you can make in Adobe Spark. A social graphic, that's just like a static meme. A short web page, so that is still not something that uh, we're looking for. But the presentation is a sh called a short video. It turns it into an MPEG-4 video that you can download and you can upload back to us. So the short video is the Adobe Spark presentation. In order to work with this, um, you have to sign up with them, but it doesn't cost any money. Signing up with them just gives you your own space. Therefore, you can work on files, uh, check out, go away, and uh, you've got online cloud space that uh, while you're working. And there are a lot of great functions with Adobe uh, uh, Spark videos and um, uh, they're easy to learn and they have a lot of great functions and they include a lot of great clip art from Adobe. Adobe is the company that makes the creative arts, uh, the creative uh, suite with Photoshop and Af After Effects and Illustrator and all of that stuff. So it's really high in graphics and this is their sort of free intro tool. And uh, we highly recommend it. It's easy to use. It's easy to get great uh, effects out of. And we want you to use the vi short video version if you're going to use Adobe Spark. VoiceThread, probably haven't heard of VoiceThread. Those of you that are on older Android phones, you're gonna find that a lot of the tools that we are offering, PowerPoint and lots of other things, they just don't work on an older Android phone, though they, they aren't quite as multimedia capable. Well, we found that VoiceThread is one program that does work on older Android phones. So if that's the tool that you have to work with uh, and you're having trouble finding a presentation tool, we recommend that you use VoiceThread. It's not super slick, but it does everything we ask you to do. It records audio, it creates slides, it goes through in a stepped fashion. Uh, there are a lot of online tools okay. like Turn it into the patio. Uh, somebody needs to mute themselves. Okay, uh, I took care of that. Thank you. Um, so uh, there, there are a lot of online tools and we have a link here to a lot of them. So you can go and look through these if you're wanting to know what Prezi and uh, GoAnimate and Emays does, etc. cetera, uh, they're useful. Uh, one thing to know about a lot of these 
online tools is that they do not include audio themselves, which means you've got to have to create your own audio and bring it in. But a, a tool like Prezi or Emaze, you can import audio into it and add it and link it up. And that's what you'll need to do if you're going to use that. Uh, note that Google Slides doesn't include audio either. So uh, each one of those has different solutions that are needed. So what is the audio that you could use? Well, we recommend if you're on a Mac or a PC that you use an audio called uh, Audacity. Audacity is free open source software that has this really nice visual menu. So when you record yourself, you can see the WAV file that you're recording and you can actually edit it very easily. And it exports as any kind of file. You can create an MPEG-3, an MPEG-4 file. Um, it's, it's really easy to work with and it's free. Uh, so it's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. It's not available for the phones. Uh, but if you're on a desktop and you want to record audio, Audacity is the way to go. Uh, and, uh, and there are a lot of really great ways, tutorials online uh, on uh, uh, YouTube and such that can help you work through it. But it's also such a simple interface that you're, uh, you can open it up and, and sort of start working from scratch. Now, if you're on the phone and you need to create audio, I've got a couple of links here as well. I have an article on uh, iOS voice memo recording tips. So if you're going to use your iPhone or you're going to use your iPad, there's a free app that's already on there from Apple called Voice Memo that just records your audio and turns it into an audio file that you can uh, email or, or share or, or um, send other places. So these are tips for recording with your phone. And then uh, for, if you're on an Android, I have some uh, a list of Android audio uh, files or programs that you could use as well. They're mostly all available in Google Play. Uh, in terms of recording your voice with audio, uh, what I want you to do is talk in a normal room voice. So uh, most of us when we're on the phone, uh, you know, it's a private thing and, you know, we, we know that the phone is right up against our face. We don't want a lot of other people hearing our conversation. So we have a phone voice where we're, maybe it's not a whisper, but it's a little bit like a whisper. You're not speaking very loudly and you've got that phone right up next to your mouth. So there's no, no question that the person that you're talking to can hear you. If you're using your phone as a microphone, as a recording audio tool, it's a little bit different because I want you to project to the room. I want you to use your room voice uh, in terms of doing a presentation, there is a qualitative difference from talking very quietly, almost mumbling, almost talking to yourself, or talking to the room. And this is where we meet the professional speaker. We want to hear your room voice. We want to hear you projecting out to people in the crowd. You don't necessarily have to be talking to a 300 seat auditorium but imagine yourself in a room large enough to have, you know, five or 10 people in it and you want to make sure that you're projecting to everyone. You're using a louder voice and in using a louder voice, there's more power coming out of the air in your mouth, which means that you no longer put the microphone right up next to your face. If you, if you held your phone like you do in a normal phone call and you talk this way, you're going to overmodulate. You're going to, you're going to make a bad recording. So the way we, uh, compensate for that is we hold the phone back about four to five to six inches away from our face. Uh, in recording audio, it's a little bit like the way light is. Uh, you turn on the light and you're right next to the light. It's very bright, but this fur the further away you come from the light, the, 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 the intensity of the light drops off in a kind of rapid fashion. And so as with audio, if you're right up on audio, you're gonna get the full power of it. But if you're back just a little bit, you hit the sweet spot, and then you go back a little too far and you don't get good audio. So in, in regards to using your phone as an audio source, using the microphone on your phone, you wanna make sure you're holding your, your phone about five or six inches away from your mouth and talking with uh, room intensity. And likewise, on your laptop, one of the things you wanna think about is where on your laptop your microphone is. Maybe you've never even thought about this, but uh, usually the microphone on the laptop is buried at the top of the keys. So it's right near the hinges of where a laptop is, or uh, uh, 
uh, where a laptop folds. It's at the back of the keyboard. And if your keyboard, if your laptop is sitting on a table and you're sitting upright at a desk, that means that you're 30 to 40 inches away from that microphone. That's too far away. So if without thinking about it, if you talk in normal voice and you record with the microphone uh, on the laptop, you're gonna get kind of a weak, hollow recording, echoey recording, because you're too far away. The solution to that is just simply to lean in a little bit closer. Make sure you're like 10 to 15 feet away from that microphone, and then you'll sound fine. Now, some people get additional microphones. If you have a, a microphone headset, and then that microphone is then attached off the earpiece and is, is, is close to your face like a, a phone is. And there isn't an issue with that. If you get an external mic, again, the trick is to be five to 10 inches away and then the sound will be good. So uh, uh, you have to assess what your equipment does and it's easy to do a test. If you aren't sounding loud enough, talk louder, get close to the microphone. If you're over shooting it and you're getting a lot of noise and distortion, move the microphone further away. And uh, it's very easy to find a quick spot with one or two little uh, uh, movements. Uh, so I'm gonna open up for questions right now. We're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the tools and such, but I think that that's a, uh, this is a good time for, for uh, questions. Uh, Maria asked that question I think I just answered. What if we have a headset? Uh, so, typically, uh, the microphones on a headset are like these pencil thin mics that, that project along the side of the mouth, and they're meant to be about three or four inches away, uh, and they're actually modulated for that kind of sound. You know, if, if you get a, if you, if you have gamer gear, and you have a microphone that's in your, uh, your headset for playing online games, then it's already been set up for, you know, pretty much the way that you talk and, uh, it's pre-configured that way. And using those kinds of gear with Audacity will get you good effects. So it uh, shouldn't be a problem. What if we have a headset with a microphone on it? Um, all right, well, that, that's the same question. So do we have any more questions or else I'll, I'll just keep going? Uh, all right, so there's a variety of, of options. There's some options I wanna move you away from. Please don't use Powtoons. Powtoons was a great website, uh, but they have moved into wanting to squeeze nickels and dimes out of everyone, which means that they'll sign you up, but then you try to get your, your, the piece that you created out of it and they'll make you give them money. And we don't like that, so don't even start. Uh, just consider Powtoons a bait and switch kind of place. And there are a number of them. So even though we've got a lot of, things represented in here. Some of them are places that you should avoid, and I can't tell you exactly which ones. Uh, that is a great thing for using the discussion for. So if you, just, if you find a, a software that you've used that you've had a bad experience with, please log in and warn other people about. If you had a software that you've had a great experience with, log in and, 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 and give everybody else the benefit of your advice. That's part of what we're using this discussion about this week. Another thing about this week's discussion board is that it's gonna be open for two weeks. It's gonna be open next week. So while during the week here, if you wanna post your script, if you wanna post some, some of your initial audio that you record and get feedback on that before you finish the whole program, that's a great way to use this uh, uh, forum. But then also at the end of the week, when you turn in your file to me for a grade, I want you to also post in here for your classmates to give you feedback. Because next week, we're going to improve this presentation based on the feedback we receive. So you'll receive feedback from me. And if you're lucky, you might receive feedback from some of your classmates. In order to do that, you've got to post it in here. And this discussion board, again, it's going to stay open all through next week. So if you post in here, uh, you'll know that next week people can come back and take a look at it and, and that sort of thing. So um, one thing I wanted to get to was talking about one of the gotchas in PowerPoint, something that's really important. I like PowerPoint. I, you may catch me just always nagging or saying negative things about PowerPoint. It's incredibly great and powerful software. It's also a little bit frustrating, so I wanna make it better. So what I wanna do is I wanna start a project here. So I'm gonna pick a theme. 
Uh, okay. All right, and it's dropping me into my first slide. And so I'm gonna just give this a, a little title here. My brand. Yeah, put my name on it. So here I have a title slide, it's my slide one. So very important to know where your slide one is in, in PowerPoint. And before I go anywhere else, I'm just gonna add a few more slides. So uh, I'm gonna add a slide here and I'm gonna be creative and call that slide two and add another slide. And oh, maybe I'll call this one slide three. And uh, let's see, one more. But you know what I'm gonna name this? I'm gonna name this one slide four. So I've got a couple of slides here. What is my strategy for adding audio? I do not, absolutely do not want you to add audio to each slide. That is not the way we go. That's the way a lot of people treat PowerPoint because they can't figure it out. That's not the correct way to do this. You need the ability to work with PowerPoint. One of the great functions, one of the great um, creative possibilities is, is the opportunity to move these slides around. Once you've created all these slides, you might want to change the order of things. So uh, if, you, if you lock your audio into the slides, you can't do that. So what we want you to do is we want you to put all the audio in slide one. That is the proper way to work with PowerPoint. Now, if you create your audio somewhere else, if you use Audacity, you're going to create an audio file. You can go up and you can insert audio and you can, audio from file will allow you to, to take that audio file and put it in here. But for most of you, if you're using PowerPoint, one of the reasons you wanna use PowerPoint is the one-stop shop. So it also has its own recorder. It's not as full featured as uh, Audacity, but it gets the job done. So if I wanna record my audio, I'm gonna to go to insert, audio, record audio. And I have to be on slide one because that's where it's gonna dump my file. So I open this up and I have a little tool here that's gonna record for me. It's not gonna show me the WAV file, it's not gonna let me edit, it's not gonna do any of those fancy things. But I can read this, I, I, uh, I, I, I can say my vo uh, voiceover, it'll record it and when I'm done, it'll drop it in. If I don't like it, I can get rid of it and I can record it again. So it, it, it's easy to do and redo until you get it right. But one of the issues with PowerPoint is that really you're not gonna be editing that file. So uh, you just need to get it right all the way through. And the way you do that is through a lot of rehearsal. You know, once you've written your script, say it out loud without recording it just to get the feel of it and then record it. And then if you don't like that recording, trash it and do it again, because it's not gonna take a lot of time and it's really easy to, uh, to just run through and do another recording in real time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this, I'm gonna record some. I'm just gonna hit the record button here and right now we're, we're, we're recording, this would be my three to four minute voiceover if I were doing it and so forth. Uh, and when I'm done, all I have to do is stop the recording and hit insert and then it puts this icon on my desktop, this audio icon. So I know that I've got an audio file here. Now the reason that this is important is there are hidden menus in PowerPoint that don't show up until you actually have files to deal with. And so there are some important choices to be made about audio in PowerPoint. And you don't even have the option to look at those menus until you've created an audio file. So the first thing you have to do is to get your audio. And once you do, when you select that audio and it's on slide one, you'll suddenly see that there are two actually new menus that show up uh, in the toolbar. I'm gonna do that again. I don't have it selected, you don't see them. We're looking at the toolbar up here. See where my cursor is? If I hit the audio file, suddenly audio format and playback are available to me. And if I select playback, I have the opportunity to tell the audio file to click the start or play automatically. We want it to play automatically. We don't wanna make our audience have to click through things. So we wanna play the audio automatically and very importantly, Right below it is play across slides. If you do not click this, then the audio on slide one will only stay on slide one. It will never cross across. But as soon as you do this, as soon as you play, click play across slides, you now have the ability to have all your audio run across your entire program. 
So this in conjunction with uh, the ability to record uh, practice runs gives you the ability to create a finished slideshow. What am I talking about? Well, I've got my audio on slide one here. It's my full audio and I've got a series of slides here. If I go to slideshow, record slideshow, that's what you want to select, record slideshow, it's going to go into playback mode and it's going to dump me on slide one and automatically start playing the audio. And it's going to stay there until I tell it to advance. So now what I want to do is have a practice recording of my presentation. Whenever I want to transition from slide one to slide two in my audio, I'll listen for that point and I'm going to manually do it in this record slideshow section. So I'm going to do this right now. I hit record. And right now we're, 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 we're in playback. Be my three to four minute voice. And now I'm going to go slide two and so forth. Uh, I'm going to slide three. Done, all I have to do is I'm going to slide four. And we hit out of it and tell it to save. Now, you'll notice that I had messed up the slides because I moved them around. But it has this order and it now has five minutes of my original audio on slide one, two minutes on slide two which says slide three, but it's now my slide two because it's locked in that way. Two minutes of audio on slide three and two minutes of audio on slide four. That now will play back that way for anybody that wants to get this file. And if I messed up the sync, I can just go back and re-record it again. So you can run this as many times as you want. If you wanna get the sync better, you could, you could run it again. If you wanna add a slide or take a slide or move the slides around, you know, if I wanted to put this back in order and move slide two back over here, then I could re-record this and, 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 and do that as much as I want. So that is a lot of power that, that PowerPoint gives you. And it's a great reason to use PowerPoint, but it's frustrating as hell to me that they don't tell anybody that it's there because if you've never used PowerPoint before, who would know? Well, I'm telling you. So if you wanna use PowerPoint, this is the way you need to work with it. And I want everybody to know that and make sure that you, you know, don't tear your hair out trying to figure out where the audio is. Let's go back and look how everybody's doing with their uh, ideas here. Nick has a, a spaceman for dependable. Uh, he looks pretty badass. I guess you have to imagine that he's dependable. Uh, Isaac has a, uh, uh, a happy artist for being eager. And Anna has a uh, Rubik's Cube set for problem solvers. So these are all very interesting, very good solutions, showing different styles, showing different aesthetic notions. Uh, Elizabeth has a pretty cool uh, fantasy image for adventurous. And Eric uh, has a uh, pretty groovy team for team players. So we're lo having lots of great pop culture references, having lots of great visuals. I think you guys understand what I'm talking about here. These are the kinds of images that tell a story in an exciting way and are gonna make you break out of the box when you're talking about some of your own skills and things that you have to do. And so uh, the, the, the style of art or the type of imagery you're choosing says who you're speaking to. And it's part of your job as a creative presenter to figure out and match the right images with the right people. Um, all right, so we have any more questions? If not, uh, I'm gonna be available all week. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some technical issues and I love to solve those problems. So we will uh, be available and uh, we'll be posting different stuff for you to take a look at and so forth. But I want you to, to, to use the entire week. I want you to have fun, but I want you to work in the fashion that we talked about. I want you to make your narrative first. If you write a script, uh, that's a good idea. You don't have to turn in the script or anything, but it's a good idea to start with the script. So that's where you're gonna go from the plan, from the plan to a script, from the script to an audio voiceover. I want you to get your vo voiceover done before you start working on the slides. Once you've created your voiceover, you've got a lot of options. Pick these, the, the program that you wanna use, share your ideas with other people. 
uh, and talk to other people and uh, figure out what works for you, figure out, you know, uh, what makes you feel creative. All right, so uh, I'm gonna let you guys go. Do we have any more questions here? I think we're some Star Wars talk. That's probably not for me. Um, anybody got a question? If not, I'm gonna let you guys go. I want you guys to have a great week. I want you to be really creative. I want, this is the time where you should be having lots of fun. Uh, and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Night, everybody. Hi, right, thank you. <laughs>